Welcome to No Worries Biology. My name is Anja Doyle and today I would like to take you into Biosphere 2. You might be asking, Biosphere 2, what is that? Well, let's start by thinking about the term biosphere. The biosphere, sometimes also called ecosphere, is the sum of all the places on Earth inhabited by some form of life. It reaches from the deep sea, where specialized fish and certainly microorganisms dwell, to about two kilometers into the air, as high as some birds fly. It consists of the inhabited outermost crust of the earth with its stones and soil, the lithosphere, all the bodies of water on earth, oceans, lakes, rivers, and so on, the hydrosphere, and the atmosphere, those inhabited areas filled with gases, mainly nitrogen and oxygen, and to a lesser degree, carbon dioxide as well. So if the biosphere includes every place on Earth that is inhabited by some form of life, where could the biosphere too possibly be? Well, it's located within our common natural biosphere, the biosphere 1, if you want to put it that way. More precisely, it's located in the Sonora Desert in southern Arizona, about 50 kilometers north of Tucson. Biosphere 2 is a campus about 1.2 hectares in size, which is covered by a variety of glass pyramids and glass domes and encased below by a metal pan. It was constructed between 1987 and 1991, and this privately funded venture cost about $150 million. Its main purpose was to create an ecological system that was completely sealed off from the outside world, but able to sustain itself, as well as humans living within it. So, the purpose was to explore if and how it would be possible to create a new human-made biosphere that was modeled after our common natural biosphere. So this explains the name Biosphere 2. It is a new man-made biosphere, which is located within Biosphere 1, but is completely separate and sealed off. And it also is a kind of miniature copy of our common natural biosphere. This project was pioneering research into if and how it would be possible to create sustainable inhabitable places for humans in space. So, for example, on the Moon or on other planets like Mars or on spaceships that go on long journeys. And, of course, this setup of a living laboratory also enabled scientists to conduct certain experiments they could never conduct in Biosphere 1. For example, changing certain environmental factors like temperature, water, carbon dioxide levels, and study the effects these changes have on certain ecosystems. In its original setup, Biosphere 2 contained living quarters for the humans living within it, research labs, a farming area for agricultural use, the so-called technosphere, which contains all the machines necessary to support life, for example, temperature regulators, machines that control the amount of water circulating through the system, carbon dioxide regulators, wind machines, and so on. The technosphere also contained a huge artificial lung, which was necessary to equalize temperature-related fluctuations in air pressure within Biosphere 2. Biosphere 2 also contains five living models of biomes that can be found on Earth. A tropical rainforest, a savanna, a mangrove wetland, a coastal fog desert, and a tropical ocean with coral reef more than 3.5 million liters in volume. Those five model biomes are representatives of the biomes on Earth. Depending on which source you're referring to, 
there are 10 to 13 different biomes on Earth. But they weren't able to model all of them in Biosphere 2. Well, for one reason, Biosphere 2 is only located in Arizona, which has very high temperatures and very high light intensity in summer. So they weren't able to model polar ice caps, tundras, tigers, or alpine biomes. So the biomes they did model in Biosphere 2 are adapted to warm or very warm temperatures. They placed those biomes that need somewhat lower temperatures lower than the others within the setup of the biosphere because everybody knows warm air rises. They also slightly sloped the soil within Biosphere 2 to enable the water uh, that is circulating within the biosphere to move more easily between biomes and to pool in those biomes that need more moisture than others. In the technosphere, they have huge water canisters where they can retain water in case there's too much water circulating through the system. And they also use these storage canisters to collect water so that they were able to use it for irrigation in the farming area. When construction of the campus was completed in 1991, they put this self-sustaining system, which might someday in the future help us to establish space colonies, to its first practical test. A group of eight people moved into Biosphere 2. For the duration of the experiment, they would represent the almost 8 billion people living on Earth in Biosphere 1. Well, the entrance was sealed behind them, and it was supposed to only be reopened after two years when the experiment was over. Sealing the entrance behind them was supposed to highlight that Biosphere 2 is a materially closed system. For the duration of the experiment, nothing was allowed to leave Biosphere 2. No waste, no air, nothing. And nothing new was supposed to enter Biosphere 2. No supplies, no tools, no food, and so on. In terms of energy, Biosphere 2 wasn't a closed system. And Biosphere 1 is neither. Our external energy source in Biosphere 1 is the sun. For Biosphere 2, it was the grid and generators. They would have loved to only supply Biosphere 2 with solar energy, but in the early 90s, solar technology simply wasn't evolved enough to make this goal achievable. To sum it up, except for energy, Biosphere 2 was completely self-sufficient during the experiment. Of course, the team inside was in constant communication with the outside world and mission control. Even if I'm running a risk of stating the obvious, those eight people were volunteers. They were scientists and doctors that had gone through intense training to prepare them for life in such confined and isolated circumstances. As stated before, the experiment lasted for two years, and those two years brought a number of challenges and problems that needed to be dealt with by the inhabitants of Biosphere 2. Among these challenges was a condensation buildup on the glass roof of Biosphere 2 that quickly turned the coastal fog desert into a kind of chaparral area, but that was rather a nuisance than a big problem. In fact, as nothing was allowed to leave or enter the biosphere too, they needed the water within the system to create its own water cycle, and condensation was a crucial part of this water cycle within biosphere too. A much bigger problem was that they experienced an increase in carbon dioxide levels and a decrease in oxygen levels within Biosphere 2. At its low point, the air within Biosphere 2 contained only 14.5% oxygen instead of the regular 21%. For this reason, in 1993, oxygen was occasionally injected into Biosphere 2. 
technically, this went against the principle of having Biosphere 2 be a completely self-sustaining system for the duration of the experiment. On the other hand, you could argue that this experiment was designed to find these existential problems and to learn how to solve or overcome them. I mean, this is why they conducted this experiment on Earth within Biosphere 1. Yes, in the early 90s, they didn't have the technology to build something comparable in space or on the moon. But I think even if they did, they would have conducted the experiment on Earth first to be able to intervene if necessary, to conduct those changes that need to be done in order to keep the system running. In a long and desperate investigation, they found that the decrease in oxygen had nothing to do with the biological aspects of the experiment. And the system wasn't leaking either. It was the concrete they used when constructing Biosphere 2. It reacted with the oxygen in the air and bound it. After the experiment was over, they went in and sealed the concrete and this problem did not reoccur. Another big problem was food production. They produced considerably less food in Biosphere 2 than had been calculated during planning. The main reason for this was the weather anomaly El Niño, which occurred twice in the early 90s. El Niño causes clouds and rainy weather in Arizona in Biosphere 1, which leads to a significant reduction in sunshine in Biosphere 2 as well as Biosphere 1, and that reduces the farming output. Well, the team within Biosphere 2 needed to deal with this problem internally, so the Bionauts all had to go on a diet. While they did get all the nutrients they needed, they were not capable of getting enough calories to match their high energy consumption during the long and strenuous white days in Biosphere 2. The Bionauts were hungry for long stretches of time and all of them experienced significant weight loss during the experiment. One day, one crew member injured herself quite severely by cutting her finger. She got permission to leave Biosphere 2 to seek medical attention outside and then she returned right after. For this incident and a number of other reasons, the two-year experiment within Biosphere 2 was heavily criticized by some. Well, I guess there are always different views on any given topic. Another serious issue were the group dynamics amongst the eight Bionauts. Living so close together for an extended period of time without the opportunity to get away every now and then caused serious frictions amongst the Bionauts, which eventually led to a split of the group into two factions. Unfortunately, they weren't able to counteract these tendencies, and so some of them aren't really on speaking terms to this day. Kind of sad, but also a known phenomenon from other extreme circumstances, like life on a research station in Antarctica. Well, this first mission in Biosphere 2 eventually came to a close in 1993. The Bionauts were allowed to leave Biosphere 2 and return to Biosphere 1. The collected data was evaluated, changes were implemented, and then they started to plan a new mission. In March 1994, seven scientists, different people by the way, became Bionauts in a second experiment. This experiment was announced to last for 10 months, and this time the crew members were able to produce enough food. However, this time it was the outside world that created immense problems. There were disputes over management and financing, lawsuits, and even potentially a sabotage attempt. But this last one remains unclear and disputed. All kinds of unpleasant stuff in any case. In September 1994, this second experiment ended after just seven months 
and there has never been another similar mission. In the following years, Biosphere 2 was sold several times and eventually the University of Arizona bought the campus in 2007. Now they are using it as a geological research institute, so today Biosphere 2 is the largest geological experiment on Earth. At the moment they are working on a project called LEO, short for Landscape Evolution Observation. They are researching the influence of certain environmental factors on the creation and alteration of landscapes over time. Particularly with regards to the experiments conducted in the 90s, but also looking at the research conducted here today, Biosphere 2 seems to me an excellent example for the ingenuity of humans in exploring and investigating new horizons. And who knows, maybe in the not too far future, insights gained here might help mankind to establish space colonies. Amongst many other aspects, Biosphere 2 has helped us to understand Biosphere 1 as a closed system as well, which influences us and which we are influencing as well. It has shown us as a model that if we are careful with our environment and if we are willing to put in the effort, we are capable of contributing to nature's equilibrium. This is it for today. If you liked this video, and our virtual field trip into Biosphere 2, go to www.noworriesbiology.com to find more materials on different aspects and topics of biology. See you next time.